Welcome into the Cam and Strict podcast. What's up, everybody? I'm Andy Strickland. Cam Jansen in the hizzy somewhere, somewhere through the woods. You just got to go through the woods that maybe you'll find Cam Jansen. What up, Cam? I'm in the same spot I have been for the past, like, four months. Okay. How's that treating you? I'm lovely. It's yeah. lovely. I don't get to barbecue today like I wanted to. I'm a barbecue connoisseur these days, Andy Strickland. That's all I do is barbecue. I don't even eat the barbecue that I barbecue. I just do it, do it, and then cake gets pissed because I don't eat it. So then I hand it to the neighbors, which they don't eat. So they give it to their animals, probably. Dude, but, I uh, hear I hear your neighbors are pissed at you. Somebody was banging down your door, oh, all, damn, all upset. What's that? Yeah, I don't know. It's just when it wasn't upset. He, <laughs> I was telling a story, and he thought I was telling it about him. But I don't bring names out. The only names I call out <laughs> are my mom and dad, or yours, or or Kate. And I'm like, no, dude, like, dude, I got like, I'm an entertainer, man. They're like. like like, I got to tell stories. Don't You can't think that it was about you. And it just was one of those things, and that's going to happen. This happened before, but it's like, you know, Were you it wasn't, scared? Did he scare you? Or, like, were you, you talking like, about? Were you, you in turtle about? position? Like, what, what are you talking on with yourself? No, because I don't want, I don't know. I was scared because I don't like when people misinterpret things. And mm. it doesn't happen too often, but sometimes it does, especially when you're doing shit every fucking day, and you're telling stories, and you gotta be funny, and you're quarantined, you're, you're fucking giving a play-by-play of the dog next door, sniffing asses in the goddamn meadows <laughs> with all the cats <laughs> cruising around. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. And so I'll people see. are like, is that my fucking cat? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. Don't talk about I'm like, I didn't, that wasn't your cat. Like, that kind of shit. So this dude comes and bangs on your door. Have you have you seen him since? Because I know you weren't home. But you were pissed. It, I know who he is. Did we're you all, address No, I, I, was, I was confused. Mm. I was confused. And I did. And then and he, and it just, it worked out to be nothing. It just was confused. I was just confused a little bit. Uh, but he was, I, he was, he was more joking than anything. But that has happened before. And I, and I, and I you know, oh God, I think I was, I was chirping Patty. Um, a couple times, maybe I was chirping, uh, I don't know, maybe talking about Oakville being hillbilly-ish, and I think his mom and dad got pissed at me one time, but other than that, like, well, he yeah. chirps Eureka, what's the difference? What's more what hillbilly, uh, uh, Oakville or Eureka? Um, is know, Eureka South, hillbilly? That's South County, not, not is, really, I mean, it used to be a little more, um, it, it sounds pretty hillbilly, hillbilly with that guy banging down your door. Oh, no, that's just, that's just, I've lived in the same spot for 18 years and to see we're comfortable with each other kind of thing. And everybody knows uh, where I live. I know a okay. guy bang on my door the other day and I'm like, man, no, in coronavirus going on, in coronavirus, I could call me or something or write a, write a, a letter and leave it. I, I just don't, it's just a little too close. Like I'm very sensitive with that. Although I think this is probably for the most part bl- more blown out of proportion than anything, hopefully, but I'm mm-hmm. still hesitant to get close to people in Strickland if you really want to know. Okay. Besides well, I, would be, I would be hesitant <laughs> too, but they want to open it back up. We'll see where this goes. I know. All this hockey talk happening about playing games in different cities and whatever. I, I will say this because some people have brought up some of these cities and Emailing back and forth with Bill Daly last night, he says none of the cities that have been brought up are accurate. So, again, we don't even know where they're going to play these games, but they're not going to be playing with fans, man. I, I got I to gotta admit, I'm just kind of excited to see how it plays out. Like, what's it going to look like? Yeah. How are these games going to look, man? I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm actually kind of pumped up about it because it's going to be different. I, I, I'm going to look at how they set it up, and I'm going to be like, wow. As a guy that goes on the radio every single day, does multiple hits throughout Canada, and then I still haven't figured out in my head how to even come up with an idea. So when I see somebody that actually does it, I look, damn, tip of the cap to you, sir. Good, good, good job for having a big brain. My brain doesn't work that way. And sometimes people ask me, like, hey, what do you think? I'm like, ah, ee, ooh, ah, uh. I'm like, how can can I tell a story about something instead? Like, don't don't make me break this stuff down. But Andy, you certainly, your brain does work that way. So what do you think? What do you want to see happen as far as where they play, scheduling, you know, the the number of players you can have on a team? Maybe they're going to have more players on a team because you're going to be playing so many games in a row that you're going to, you know, you have to dress. You, you have 30 guys on a roster where you have to implement where th- guys can't play three and three or whatever the case is. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think that's uh, oh, yeah. Well, that's an obvious concern. You're going to have to expand the rosters, especially with. Guys haven't been doing anything for the last several weeks, so you got to assume that you know, injuries or soreness 
is going to come into play, especially for a team like St. Louis. Say, say they play five more regular season games, and I'm just throwing that number out there. Say they get to 76 or whatever. You know, do the Blues feel like they've got to push the limit on Tarasenko or O'Reilly? If, if any of these guys, if they come back and all of a sudden they have a little bit of groin soreness, hamstring soreness, like they're not pushing to get in. Obviously, you want that number one seed, but who knows what the playoff format's even going to look like. So they're going to probably need to expand the rosters. And, yeah, man. Uh, and, and allow, you know, allow you to kind of you know, interchange guys in or out. Yeah, and, and you know what? Um, it is going to be interesting. So it's, it's going to be such a balance because, because – you want the guys to find their groove and their timing, Andy, and just their mesh with each other. Because if the Blues don't have the mesh, they're not the team that could have a couple guys just go down and do their own thing. You know, like they need to be team oriented for them to oh, be yeah. who they are. And that is just a yes. fact. Like, yes. It's just like everybody just needs to be on the same page. We might shut you down, but we're probably not going to produce that much offense unless the guys all coexist. So it is going to be interesting how they're going to implement guys in and out and the rest and whatnot. But, you know, it's it's going to be tough, man. But it's going to be tough across the board, Andy Strickland. Right. It's going to be tough across the board. It's going to be unique for everybody. Every GM, every coach, every trainer, every – they're all going to have to uh, adapt and find – and be unique in their own way when it comes to this stuff. So it's just it's – just, you know, people are saying this might be the hardest Stanley Cup to win. They might be right. Because it's the most unique. Well, we don't know what it's going to look like yet. Or you're if there right. is one, I mean, by it's, the way. It's, it's unique from the. It's almost like a. Uh, it may have been Ben Bishop who I heard mention this recently about how it's, it's a, players are almost going to approach it like they're like they're playing in the World Cup. You know, for those guys who have played yeah, international competition. Did you ever represent you at Team USA, Cam? I forgot if you ever did that yeah, or not. No, I did. No, I well. Yeah, I got the every Olympics? time. I, well, Berkey wanted me a couple of years, or, or not Berkey, but I kept, yeah, he's Canadian. I got half citizenship, by the way. So the Canadian teams wanted me. The USA teams wanted me. They want no. I uh, <laughs> I did almost for you no. Know, when I was playing in Windsor, I remember Jordan Tutu was dominating in World Juniors, and my agent said I might have had a tryout because I had a good rookie season there, and I was getting loud. But uh, you know, BC told me that, and the guy didn't bullshit me at all. Like Scott Norton never bullshitted me. He, he, he might have been believe, bullshitting you. He, that he, may he, be the he, only time he bullshitted me. That fucking guy's never bullshitted me about anything. <laughs> I'll tell you that right now. That he would be like, no, Cam, you might go here. No, I don't know about – and he's always, he was always right. Like, he's so – you know, I'm not – I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw him a little fucking – little piece of cred right there, baby. Yeah. Um, you never know. You, you never know. know. I'm not anyway, – like, Sweet gonna, question, I'm not going to chirp your game. I'm not going to chirp your game. But, you know, everyone's talking about free agents and all this type of stuff. You know, listen, people have to stop throwing in Taylor Hall with Alex Petrangelo's name. Like, as in, like, oh, yeah, these guys are – listen, Taylor Very Hall close. is not in the same category, okay? He's not, not even close. Category. Dude, all right? On. Petro was – Petro was the best player on the fucking ice for 90% of those games the last year in the playoff run. Like, no, the most – he was the most impactful player. Blocking shots, turning around, backhand sauce in the middle, right for a guy to go out to break up, blah, 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 blah. Or coming down, having a sh- point shot, keeps the pucks alive. Did the, I mean, it was, you look back and watch on NHL Network, man. Like, just the plays. We were talking about Patty Maroon the other day. It was his birthday today, by the way, which is not going to really matter because it's going to be put out in a couple weeks. But uh, some of the plays on the wall Patty made in game seven. Like, you just didn't even notice it at the time because we're up there doing whatever we had to do. But just, he gets a puck on his backhand on the wall, doesn't even look, turns around, soft pass to the middle, where Barbashev would be perfectly on his tape every time, five times in a row, and they go down and have pressure in the offensive zone. Little things like that, you look back and watch those games, you're like, Jesus Christ. Like, that's, like, little things, man. It's just, well, that's... Listen, it's that's crazy. coaching too, because like he he gave Patty confidence. But you're right, Patty didn't make too many mistakes with the puck. Like if he didn't have a play, he would just eat it. He would just he basically kill the clock until it, it was time to change. And if he had a play to make, you know, for, especially from below the goal line, like he, he's one of the best players the Blues have had, and one of the, honestly one of the best that I've seen in a long time. Just in terms of being able to wall. control the play down low and on the wall, like on you know, the wall, he's just a man child, man. You just can't get it away. Sticks from his him. big ass out on you, dude. Like he's like, "Fucking come at me! I'll stick this ass out." And anytime you try to hit somebody when they're protecting the puck, and I would hate this too. Sometimes I had to sneak down and like, like, "Oh, I got this guy's not paying attention." When his his as and I was gonna go pin him because you can't hit a guy from behind anyway. But they they'd see it coming, and at the very last second, they'd stick their hip out and would go right on your hip flexor, and it would be like. And you're like, oh, oh, and then like, it'll, it'll buckle you for a little bit, like, 
And then, like, I would have that. He, he'd get a little separation. Now he's two steps ahead of you, and you look like a fucking jerk off. That's Let me ask you this. Let thing. me ask you this. You've got the um, this Michael Jordan documentary. You probably don't even know. Like, do you have cable out there in Eureka? Do you not even yeah. know it's on? Or no, you know actually, on? fuck you. Jordan sent me the tape. He sent this to me a fucking year ago. I just forgot to watch it. So, it, but it led me to think, like, who could the NHL, like, who is God like outside of Gretzky or Simpson? Oh, outside. You outside know, like, of like that, that you would say, hey, you wish the NHL or cameras could follow this player around for a full, like, I don't know if there, if, if, if that really exists. And you could probably say that about other sports too, although it'd be pretty, John Avery. pretty, pretty cool <laughs> to follow, like, you know, Tom Brady and Bill Belichick or something like that when he was in New England. I don't know, man. It just, it just led me to like think, like, could, could the NHL pull something like this off? Is there anybody who is interesting enough and is famous and famous enough to, to pull this off? Andy, Michael Jordan was the most famous athlete ever to exist, probably. One of the top three. Like, I mean, him, he's worldwide famous. That guy makes more money in shoe sales now, 20 years later, than all the top guys, like the top five guys combined. Curry, LeBron James. Have you, have you seen anybody buy a LeBron James shoe anywhere? No, it's fucking Jordan, dude. Like, he's making so much coin. $2.1 billion net worth. Like has an unbelievable story, comes back, tries to play Babe. Like it's like fuck. He's just like he's Babe Ruth. He might, it might, there might be two. And Gretzky's there in the hockey row. And if you don't know who Wayne Gretzky is, and I don't know what to tell you, if you're if you're at least from Missouri and northern states in Canada, if you know who Wayne Gretzky is, then I don't know what to tell you. But Babe Ruth and Jordan are my two guys where they'll live in infamy ever. Like Babe Ruth, like he's the most popular baseball player still. And they didn't have anything back then. Yeah, that's just how that's how powerful he is, and still is. Babe Ruth. Yeah, well, they're gonna the get time. into some. They're gonna get into some like crazy footage, like showing him behind the scenes how he interacted with his teammates. Well, he's gonna be a dick. practice. He's and, gonna like, be a dick. You know, like yep. I'd be curious to see how Gretzky handled his teammates between periods or on the bench and stuff like that. You know, so yeah, but listen, you, that we stuff know would be him, fascinating. Though. We yeah. know with Gretzky, though, because we could talk to the guys he played with. Well, they're not lying to us. So we know that. We know the entire – like, Greta, like, comes around. Like, we talk to him. Like, you know what type of – after being around him and talking to people that have been around him on a daily basis, basically, Andy, for years. Like, I know I can, I can imagine how Gretzky honestly was. I can certainly imagine how Brett Hall was. But oh, Jordan, for sure. But Jordan, I don't know enough about. Like, but fucking – you know, Gretzky's not telling. I don't think motherfucking you on a constant, consistent you basis. You never know, he, man. You never know. I, you, we would have heard about it. Talking about it, it would have happened <laughs> once in a while, but we have fucking. It would have been Gretzky's what, a mother. You, you know, Hollywood. You hanging out with like Mark Messier and Yuri Curry. Well, fucking. Out with those guys. Well, maybe you if you're invited, with? maybe you should be invited to more alumni stuff. But you're, you know, I don't know. Who, who's there? Know, that's who's there? Who's Gretzky? there that played on those Gretzky? Oilers teams? Gretzky. Gretzky, like, you know, in a hockey world, so tight knit, but we don't know the basketball world. That's what I'm trying to say. Like, the big stories we know from Greta, we know Holy was motherfucking guys. You know, you know, like, we know that. But fucking Jordan, it's like, let's see how fucking hardcore this guy was, because I personally don't know, and certainly you don't either. You don't know. You have no idea. I just had to say, I don't know Jordan. Although hey, he listen, sent me the tape hey, a year ago. How about <laughs> Michael Jordan? First of all, ESPN does an amazing job with these documentaries, man. Like, they're unbelievable. The 30 yeah. for 30 specials are just ridiculous. And they knock it out of the park every time. With with Jordan, he's dropping F-bombs on ESPN. Like, it came out of nowhere. And I was like, wow. And I was thinking, man, what could this, could this impact traditional media moving forward? Even though you could say it's not traditional because it's on cable. But still, like everybody has cable now for the most part and has for years. So to me, it's like the same thing it's not like you go to someone's house like when I was a kid and they either have cable or they don't cam and maybe they have like three of the network channels and then somebody has cable everybody has cable how old are you 70 what the fuck you didn't have cable in your dude when I was a little kid I thought you were from the wealthy part of when I when I was from like when I was like 8, 9 years old 10 years old not everybody had cable a lot of people did I didn't have cable until until I was 12 dude I don't even think I can remember back then what the fuck I was watching on TV. To be honest, I got cable when I was twelve, but now Jordan's dropping f bombs. Like, good. How is that going to impact media moving forward? Do you think it'll have any impact? Will we see more of this? I don't thing? know. I, I, I hope people are. I, I don't care about the f bomb thing. Like I do. I that's just the way I've always been. 
look, I guess Dave Portnoy, maybe the same kind of way. He's done his thing. He's built an empire up being that way. Barstool as a whole is that way. Not necessarily trying to be, but they're just raw in themselves. And that's why it works. And the fluffy stuff, and we talk about this all the time, the fluffy stuff, it's just like, yeah, I know what kind of, I know what you're going to do. I know the questions. I know the answers. I already know it's going to be fluffy. I don't, I want raw stuff. Like what? Like talk to me. Like we're just like, like get comfortable. You know, that means to me like, I'm gonna, I want to dig at you, but just talk to me like a real person, not a robot. Being mm -hmm. in this business now, Andy, I could just tell who don't, don't talk to me like we're talking. If I saw you at, you know, like if we're going to an event or something, instead of like, I'm interviewing you, there's such a difference between interv the interview answers or just, Hey, the answers that we would be at having a drink at a, at a, at a, a, a social gathering raising money for charity yeah no, there's, such, drift, there's such a well there's such a demand now for real raw content and the, yes. the podcasts for example that have had success for the most part give you that you know people don't want to go to a podcast and hear the same thing that they're probably going to hear on the radio or here in on traditional media platforms they want to be able to hear something different hear a raw real conversation where they don't feel like you're flipping the switch like you're talking about you know, just being yourself you know so oh, I, I know it's and horrible. that's what people want yeah. and i think i think we're getting that now on the mainstream television network like espn with michael jordan where you know we we haven't always gotten that and i, I listen i hope that that's the impact and i hope we just get more of that where athletes and celebrities and, and famous people who you know are in that situation just feel like hey they can go into this and just be themselves and don't have to feel like they have to be something that they're not you know yeah, and I, and I, you know, Andy, well, we, we're doing the same thing. And, you know, when people come on our, our, on this podcast, they're pretty pretty real. Like, they're comfortable yeah. with us. And not too comfortable to where, to where like, we don't, need, we don't need to do the gotcha stuff. And, and you know, don't mean what to say that. He, yeah, it's just him. It's just right. him. Like, he made sure that we knew that. And, you know, Bobby Ryan coming up here, man, he was comfortable. And he, you know, that kind of, you see, he explained the story like, God, I can't, like, we fucking went through a hardcore time. It's the most bizarre thing in the world with Bobby the story went through and he overcome it he's still going through demons as we speak and yes Listen, he's made a ton Ryan's of money a perfect example cam of yeah. of i want people to tune into this podcast and it's okay if you don't know who the who the guest is or maybe you're not very familiar with who they are but then all of a sudden you listen to it and you're like wow i like this guy man this guy's got an amazing story he's overcome a ton of obstacles just a shit ton of adversity to get to where he is and now i've got a lot of respect for this guy and now when i watch him i feel like you know what i have a better stronger connection with him because i heard him interviewed and heard him be real on a uh, on an interview and that's listen that's how he was here man the, the stuff that he's gone through i could say 99 percent of nhl players i'm not saying athletes in other sports haven't had dramatic adversity in their life and or to say hockey players haven't but i, I feel comfortable saying 99 percent of the players in the league have not experienced what this guy has gone through. And after, I, I, I thought that. I kind of knew his story, Cam. I, yeah, didn't, I, didn't, know. I didn't know. I didn't know talking to him. And I, I got the utmost respect for this guy. Here, let I, me put, I'm pulling for him big time. Let me put it this way. Let me put it, and then we, and then we'll, we'll get to Bobby Ryan. Sorry, we took a little long time on this way, a lot of our minds. But I, I'll say, I'll, what you just said about never been through this stuff. Players have been through a lot of crazy things. But usually they bring it on themselves. And I'm even speaking from experience on that. Like I went through some crazy, not not on that level. It's that's Bobby Ryan had nothing to do with it. Like he, this was this was this is a world that he was put in, and he's had to deal with it like a man. And he crawled out of it like a man. And they kept his family together. And it was it was just. Very, but he didn't bring it on himself. Most of these weird stories that coming out of holes, as far as uh, athletes are concerned, they did it to themselves. So this yeah, is no, completely this, different than this that. Is Does that make sense, man? Yeah. Well, man, this yeah. is out of his control. He was a little kid. Exactly. I mean, exactly. You know, like, family exactly. made mistakes, and and uh, and everyone. Listen, when you make a mistake, sometimes your entire family pays the price, man. So this is a situation where everybody paid the price, um, but they were able to overcome it, man. So it's a it's yep. a successful story in the end, even though there's been a lot of bumps in between since everything started. So check this out, man. Bobby Ryan with us here on the Camus Strip Podcast. Uh, just a crazy, crazy story, and he doesn't hold anything back. He tells you everything 
that he'd probably want to know in terms of his life and, and, uh, and shares it all with us. So we appreciate that. And Cam, as always, the show is, uh, or excuse me, this podcast with Bobby Ryan is brought to you by Bellman.com, B-E-H-L-M-A-N-N.com. Hey, if you're looking for a new set of wheels, come on now. The weather's starting to get nice. It's time to you know get into it a little bit and support the one and only Dan Bellman. Check them out online, Bellman.com. Do a virtual sales call. Let them show you different options and see what's best for you. You want a pre-owned car? Look into a pre-owned car. You want a new car? They can hook you up with a new set of wheels as well. They've got the Buick, the Cadillac, the GMC, and they're right across the street, man. You can kill two birds with one stone. You can go check out their other selection with the Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram. So uh, Cam's probably looking at a Dodge, maybe, which is all good, man. Get yourself a Dodge. I'm getting an Escalade. Looking forward to that. Dan's got Fancy a land. I'm waiting for him to drop that off for me. A new Escalade. But check it out. Bellman.com. Proud sponsor of what we do here on the Cam and Strick podcast. Cam Jansen. Also, Cope24.com, by the way. www.cope24.com. Cam, sorry to cut you off. Well, you did cut me off. And you do it, do it all the time. But I'm going to say great hockey <laughs> You people, cut me off way. more than I do. Uh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Uh, it's, going, it's, it's about even now. It's about <laughs> even now. We're not counting radio show, are we? Anyway, no. uh, Bellman, by the way, great hockey people, great people in the community. And they yep. just they support youth hockey. I just had to throw it there. And also, Coke 24. Oh, my God, Renee. What, look, just bringing awareness, bringing awareness to uh, having a child at a young age. Things like that that people just don't really necessarily think about until it's too late, and just and they help you with that. They'll educate you on all that kind of stuff, and um, just a sweet person. We deal with cool people, Andy. Like we do, like good, 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 wholesome people. Like I feel comfortable around them. Like it makes me feel like a better person being around them. To be honest with you, I know. They, like sometimes you just. You, you know, you need to be around good people, Andy. When me and you are hanging out with each other all day. Yeah, I'm with you, man. I'm with you. <laughs> hey, that's why we're hanging out with Bobby Ryan on this yeah, edition exactly. of the Cam and Strick podcast. Here's Bobby Ryan. Were you in Idaho right now with all the boys up there? Is that what you're saying? I'm here. I'm a single person here. It's uh, I think there's like five houses open up here. Are you at Gaza Ranch? Is that where you're at? Yeah, that's what it is. So yeah, Gretzky and Dougie head. Waite and Jackson, all those guys, they're all up there in the summertime or what? Yeah, I was actually just speaking with Jackson about an hour and a half ago. Nice. So it's a, yeah, it's a, we got a good crew up here. Oh, yeah, you do. That's it's, Yeah, you, you guys go up there, you got golf, you got it all. I mean, it's just like the most chill place ever, like golf courses. Is that why everybody – why why do all the hockey guys just congregate to that place? A couple guys started it up, and everybody's like, oh, you got to come up here? Yeah, I think Gretz was kind of one of the first, and guys followed. Um, but for me, like I've been in Idaho for 10 years now, uh, but I was just in a much different area uh, down outside Jackson Hole, Wyoming. But uh, I kept hearing about this place and I had no clue what was up here and finally took a trip up a couple of years ago, uh, you know, and kind of got shown the area and, uh, where I was was much more even remote than this. So we made the switch, you know, being a young family with kids. A little more stimulation for them here and and of course the golf and the lake and all that kind of stuff um just made more sense for us you know it's got a rink there too doesn't it we got a great rink yeah and there's oh actually a good God. crew yeah we got a great rink good crew guys uh tyler johnson was here uh obviously from tampa so him and i put together some pretty good skates um we got a lot of edmonton and a lot of calgary families that spend their summers here so they got kids that are, you know, the midget AAA junior level, uh, and, and Spokane, Washington's got some, some other players like Derek or Ryan that, you know, we all kind of congregate and skate together. So it's, it's a good setup. Uh, you spend there, how long have you been going up to, to Idaho? Like the last just a few years or when did you buy your house? Uh, this part of Idaho, this is my third summer. Uh, but Idaho in general, we've been, we've been t- 2010, uh, was our first year, just a place to get off the grid a little bit and, fell in love with every part of it and, you know now it's now it's home when i'm not playing hockey any bears up there man like do you know how to hunt and stuff so if a bear came around you're like oh no i, I got i know what to do in this situation <laughs> well we every now and again you get a delay on the golf course because there's a bear on one of the holes or whatnot but Good. um you know you just be loud with, with pepper spray if you're out hiking or anything but um you know a lot of a lot of wildlife we've gotten calls from you know maintenance and whatnot saying 
with your young kids stay inside because there's a mountain lion down in your area. So uh, you just kind of, you know, you prepare for it. But where we are in Gaza Ranch, uh, especially, is kind of, I mean, it's so populated that they don't, they don't really mess with you. They just kind of, they give you the, the wide berth just like we would them. Cam's a Hoosier from Eureka. He should be able to handle the bears and the mountain. But he's scared of the bears and the mountain lions. No, I you're an outdoor shut guy. Shut the fuck up. Shut, Ledoux boy. <laughs> Ledoux fancy lad motherfucker. Shut up. I'll tell you this. Those I saw on YouTube, one of those mountain lions kill a wolf. Like, they are Ugh. so athletic. Oh, they're, they're badass. Sneaky. Dude, it's, un- yeah, they're fucking badass shit. So, I'd be scared. Because in Arizona, too. We used to get mountain lions yes. in, in Arizona come into town. And it's like word spreads quickly. Like you don't leave your house. They'll fuck. They'll around. fuck you up. Yeah. I, I tell you what, though. I think Florida, though, if you go down to Florida too, so I think Idaho and Florida are completely different. But you go down to Florida, like there's gators down there that are 15 feet long, and you're golfing. You're like, oh god, look at this thing. It's like a dinosaur just sitting there for you. So you got a kind of a <laughs> different atmosphere. But fuck, it's crazy nonetheless, right? I think anybody that's ever walked from that hotel you know, uh, when you're playing the Panthers. I think it's like a double tree across the way. Yep. Yeah. Like, it's a long walk to the BB and T center. And like there's signs saying, watch out for gators when they're walking <laughs> around that big pond. So now you're, you got a bunch of guys in a suit, you know, kind of jogging down the way, trying to get away from gators. If you see but, uh, no, no gators up here. Definitely not. I've got a picture of that on my phone of that sign as you're walking where it says, watch out for alligators, man. That's not a place. They would have snagged you right up, yeah. Andy. Those oh, things were a fun. You would have been a fucking appetizer for them. You would have been an appetizer. <laughs> so, Bobby, listen, man. Um, are you quarantining like everybody else? Like, what are you doing now? Uh, I guess quarantined by nature uh, in the sense that there's nobody within, you know, a, a couple square miles. I think all of our area has got five houses open. So we haven't seen many people. We, we go in for groceries and whatnot, just like everybody else is doing. But uh, Idaho is not really shut down. They do the, you know, there's takeout food everywhere. and, and Outside of that, everything's open. Like I've played golf three or four times. Um, it's it's just the state hasn't been hit hard. It was hit hard in Sun Valley and a little bit in Boise, but we're so far up north. It's uh, it's it's, it's a different country up here. So it's, See, it's Cam, that's open. where we need to be. We need to I be know. there. Yeah. Too. Okay, hanging out. Yeah. We can just leave our house. Like we can't do anything here, Bobby. Like we got mask on. If we go to the grocery store, we can have two. Whoa, 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 whoa. Everywhere. No, 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 no. Yeah. Speak for yourself. Speak for yourself. <laughs> I'm chilling out in Eureka. I'm in here, Eureka, Missouri, right by about 20 miles outside of St. Louis, 25 miles. I do like chilling here and doing my show from, from the office. Like, I don't even think there's anything even going on. You forget about it because you're yeah. just like, oh, I'm just like, oh, I'm bored. Why am I bored? Oh, yeah, I can't go anywhere. But it's not like panic mode or anything. Like, maybe sometimes it's like out of toilet paper, but fuck, take a fucking shower. <laughs> yeah. I know back east is a little more. I was yes. speaking to my old man about Jersey. He said it's, it, I mean, it was close to Marshall Law there for a little bit, but uh, everything seems to be kind of, I guess, flattening is the word everybody gives him, but the numbers seem to be dwindling a little bit outside of New York. So hopefully we're back to work and back to doing something outside of isolating here pretty soon. You have a family there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So there's nothing boring about what we're doing. We got uh, our daughter will be four, our son will be two in July, or excuse me, June. So we're, uh, we're busy. We're in it, right? So there's, uh, you know, there's no days off with you too. So it's actually been nice, uh, you know, after the year that we had just to get here and uh, kind of, kind of just take a step back and and play parent mode for a little while. It's been great. I know it. Well, I know it. his his kid probably already stick handles around the house, Cam. Like he probably oh, yeah. has the unbelievable gonna, hands already. The kid's gonna. The kid's gonna be <laughs> six foot four. Sick fucking hair, and he's gonna be dangling motherfuckers. <laughs> just like, going to hell goals, spin around. Fucking so. stud. But man, let's yeah. get into. I want to get into a couple of things with you though, man. Like, and you know, I just got done. We, Andy and I, both we uh, we watched the uh, little documentary you did, and uh, you know, like I, you know, I know a lot of people are, know about it now, um, but you know, I didn't know the full extent to everything what you went through growing up. You know, um, uh, I, I'm trying to find a starting point to this, Andy Strickland. Maybe you could help me. Yeah. Um, but, 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 but you grew up, man. How about this? You grew up playing roller hockey. Me being from I St. Was. Louis, fucking, I played roller hockey in the basement. That's how you do it. We're not fucking yep. skating on ponds. We're playing roller hockey. So tell me yeah, how you got it. into the hockey as a well. Well, you know, I started, my mom, um, worked at a rink in, in Jersey. So I actually started on the ice and roller was just kind of taken off. 
nationally um with st louis was really you know like the leading the way there with yeah. kyle kramer and sean garson and those guys um some really really talented players and new jersey kind of was right behind that along with california so uh i don't know my dad was running a, a roller hockey team with a bunch of ice hockey players and we just kind of all made the switch to the the 99ers was the name of the team and um you know they were already <laughs> kind of nationally known at levels so i just i I I loved it. I actually preferred it over ice up until, you know, Peewees and Bantams uh, age level. But, uh, you know, by way of being out, sent out to California with my family, um, there was no ice. I mean, and we, our position financially wasn't going to allow me to rent ice or get ice for free. Mm-hmm. So I yeah. I spent all my time on, on rollerblades. Uh, I remember my dad went out and bought 50 of those those red Jofa, I think they're Jofa pucks or whatever, the roller hockey ones. Yafa. Uh, we call it Yafa, Bobby. Yofa. Yafa. Yofa. 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 That's Yofa. Stupid ass Yofa helmets, too. I hate those fucking yeah. things. What the hell is Yafa? <laughs> Yafa. But, uh, <laughs> no, that's all I did. That was it. That was all I did was shop pucks and, you know, at the local roller rink in, in Manhattan Beach, California, and, you know, got on the ice when I could. So uh, I think roller hockey is a major, like a major catalyst for my skill level 100 for sure we used to like hey and like you know playing as a young kid and then like coaching against california kids we always underestimated like how good you guys are you know because the coach or if i'm coaching whatever hey these are just roller hockey kids they don't know how to play the game and then it just completely changed just in terms of how skilled you are and I just got my new pair of rollerblades in the mail. I haven't even taken them out of the box. No one gives a fuck, Andy, it, it about that. No one mail. gives a fuck about that. He's, t- he's telling people that he gets free shit. Chuck, you, who cares? They're, they're You're not even going to use them. I got to give two more hockey sake. a shout out for sending me a free pair of rollerblades. And, Bobby, I got a pair for my kid. He's going to be four in May. So now is the oh, time nice. to get to get him on the uh, to get him on the rollerblades and start skating. But you, you credit yep. roller hockey like – more for your hands, right? I mean, as opposed to your feet, like just in terms of handling the puck and just being as skilled as you are. Well, nobody's going to want to take credit for my feet, boys. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's that is true. No, no, or, cam- or cams. Or cams. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my hands. So, or cams um, for four feet. <laughs> but I, I do think for for skill, for sure, I, I think for slow, like roller hockey is such a slow game compared to ice that in terms of being able to slow things down and see things develop a little better, I think it gives you a sense of vision. Um, and creativity, right? Like the, I mean, the skill level in roller hockey, if you just go watch Narch back then, whatever it might be now, uh, Narch, we'll yeah, that's just insane. Yeah. 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 So I, I, I think it was huge for me. I'm looking forward to going back when I'm done. I'm probably, I still keep in touch with a lot of St. Louis guys. There's got to be a 35 and over team that'll take me. Fuck that. Oh, I mean, just sure. keep playing fucking ice hockey. And imagine, but here, here, <laughs> it's good for roller hockey to get into ice hockey. But, like, yeah. imagine you're like, oh, I'm going to play roller hockey. You wouldn't be in Idaho right now. You'd be living by fucking Andy in the poor part of Ladue, Missouri. That's what you'd be doing. <laughs> so then God, you got into ice, buddy. That's all right. You know what? I know exactly. If I had stuck with roller instead of ice, I know exactly what had happened. I would have won a couple national championships with the boys at Lindenwood, and then uh, – I, I'd be playing darts every year, so I, I I still like that though. I still like the sound of that, so I'm gonna get back into it. I still talk to quite a few of them. Yeah, there's there's a team waiting for me. I know it. Fuck yeah, the there first is. podcast first podcast we've had. Kyle Kramer and Sean Garsh are getting. Uh, Fuck well, yeah, throw yeah, those names out, baby. We love those guys. Yeah. St. Louis boys, right there. Love that's it. right. They that's were, right. So they were the guys, buddy. man. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, but then uh, you played for the Junior Kings, and and you. When did you know you, you you had something special, Bobby? Like where you were just different than the other kids, and because don't tell me you didn't know. I mean, you were the second overall pick in the NHL, right, out of California yeah. before you know, go into the Ontario Hockey League. Not everybody's taking that path. You know what? I uh, speaking of the Junior Kings, like so when I went there, I, I certainly didn't know. I think I was, you know, part of the. The, the, we won two national championships, right, with the Pee Wee's Bantams, and then they went on to win again at Midgets when I went to Honey Baked. But those guys were, you know, I was a top five, maybe six player on that team, but I wasn't a like I wasn't above the rest there. It wasn't till maybe the year before the OHL Midgets that I think I started to separate a little bit, um, and a lot of that changes because things get more physical the closer you get to juniors, right? You either really shy away from it or yeah embrace it i think that's where still even now you see the difference between okay who's going to be able to take that step or who's going to be you know kind of phased out by the physicality so it wasn't until then that i started to realize okay there might be something here you know i knew i was skilled i just didn't know 
if I could make that jump, that transition. And uh, I did, obviously. And, and you know, going to Honey Baked and then Juniors and Owen Sound, like all those things kind of just um, – all those places helped me elevate as opposed to if I had stayed in California, I don't know how much further I could have taken it. So no. we, we made, you know, I, I ended up losing a national championship to those guys uh, and my friends and the junior Kings. But for me personally, I think to, to elevate my game, I had to, I had to make the most. Well, why am yeah, I forgetting the kid's name, Cam? Like he played Who? in the blues organization a couple of years ago. Great guy from California. First round pick. The oh, 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 I know who you're talking about, but you're asking me to remember anything. Why you yeah. waste your fucking breath? Who am I talking about, breath? Bobby? First round pick of the uh, Penguins, and he, he, and he played. He grew up in California. Great kid. I'm forgetting his name now. Man. Yeah, Bennett? Bo, the, the, Bo Bennett? Bo Bennett? Yeah, Bo Bennett. That's exactly There you, you go. Play with him? See? Are you older? What's that? Did you play uh, with him? No, yeah. I used to uh I used to babysit him. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie to you. So <laughs> yeah. you babysat people? Were you babysat? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jesus yeah. Christ. Like no one I look back like uh, how old were you then? Like 15, 16 babysitting? Yeah, right. Yeah, 14. Oh yeah. my god. What what parent like is, I'm looking back like I don't know what like, oh hey Cam, can you babysit my kid for me <laughs> at 16 years old? You psycho! Like that is crazy. You're a good human being, is what I'm trying to say. You played for Honey Bake though. How sick! I remember going up. It, you know, you're what are you an 88? Are you an 88? Uh, seven, 87. 87. Okay, so you're an 87. So you played. I remember going up there, man, in, in St. Louis AAA and playing fucking Honey Bake, and they would just troll us so bad. They were so good. They were the they were the king dicks. Of yeah. fucking triple A hockey at a time. Who who else is on that honey bake team with you? Um I guess Sean Hunwick, Matt Hunwick's little brother was our goalie. Um a couple guys that got drafted. Kyle Lawson was a real good player who played at the NTDP. Uh Mark Becerra was actually sounds Mark was on a different team. Um, you know, from our team, not a not a lot of guys that like made the big jump, but certainly guys that played division one, right? Guys that earned scholarships and then yeah. Um, and, and that was, that was it. That's surprising uh, though. That's surprising though. Cause even my triple A team, Joey Vitale played with me. That's two NHL guys right there from St. Louis. Yeah. And we get slaughtered 15, nothing by those guys up there. Hey, <laughs> it was Cam, Cam, they had Bobby Ryan on the team. Like that's, yeah, Bobby, you were all fucking all dangling everybody. <laughs> he was dangling everybody back then. <laughs> Don't be Eric Lindros. We asked Eric Lindros the other day. We interviewed yep. him the other day. And we're like, dude, like weren't like you couldn't even fucking you were so dominant. He's like, look, I never really thought about it. I'm like, how can you not think about that? Yeah, he knows. Were, he, knows. <laughs> he knows what the fuck he's talking. Bobby about. knows too. So Bobby when, knows too. You had you had in the draft in 2005. Crosby, it's the, it's the Crosby draft, right? And yeah, it kind of sucked because you're coming out of the um, the lockout that year. So did you did you think you were going to go as high as number two? What were your thoughts heading into the draft? I knew I knew anywhere from two to six. Um, basically it, it could have gone any, any way, right. There were four guys in that mix, um, with Joe Beverly, Jack Johnson, uh, Puya and price. Mm-hmm. And, uh, like nobody knew where it was going to fall until the night before the draft. I, I had a really good interview a couple of days before the draft and, and thought that Anaheim was going to pick me just based on the interview. Um, and then Brian Burke actually confirmed it to me the night before. So I was able to, kind of take it easy the, the night before and just, you know, not be all pent up. I knew I was going number two. Um, and that, that made it easy. I, I, I truthfully, the draft was such a shit show, uh, because of the fact that it was in a ballroom, uh, at the Ottawa Weston, right. You're putting, <laughs> you're putting together, just, there's only 20 players there as opposed know, to what it would I be know. like. So it was kind of a mess. Um, you only had, you're only allowed to bring four people. So, I think I was more concerned about all the stuff that was going on around the draft than just maybe mm-hmm. sitting there and taking it all in stride. I just, I was like, all right, let's, you know, let's get this over with. And and then I had to go right from there to uh, the world junior camp and then right into training camp with the Anaheim and all that. So it was, it was, it's a bit of a mess the whole summer, to be honest with you. But yeah, Berkey, sucks you couldn't have the, uh, the traditional draft. Why is that? You, am I minding you for asking why that happened? Oh, cause of the lockout or cause the lockout came. Yeah. Cause the yeah, lockout. No. I know, I know, I know. I, I remember the lockout, Andy. I fucking played. Yeah. In well, I don't know if you fucking. Well, apparently, you don't fucking remember. Well, there's fifth, there's five fucking heavies on each team. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Motherfucker. Berkey though, Berkey yeah. had to like be interesting, right? I mean, was he the Berkey we know now, even back then? 
uh, I think he's probably a little more tame now <laughs> and, and a little more politically correct. But what you see with Berkey, you, you always know where you stand, and everybody likes to fall back on the thing that happened in 2014 with the media stuff for him and all, um, you know, and the, and the Sochi Olympics announcement. And, and uh, I think there's a lot of bad blood, and there really isn't. I mean, uh, I think I'm as friendly with Berkey as anybody is with a GM that drafted them. You say hello when you cross paths, and that's about it, right? But, uh, um, yeah, he was, I, what I always appreciated with Berkey, um, for me is that if he didn't like something you were doing or he disagreed or, or, or like my first camp, I was out of shape. He just, there was no, Hey, Hey, we're really happy with you. Is a sit down. You need to get your act together. Uh, you've never worked out in your life before. We're going to teach you how to do it all. So, um, he was hard, but he actually knew how to be hard on you with trying to, make you understand what the end goal was, right? It wasn't just, okay, I'm just going to treat you like shit and make you a better player. It was, okay, here's what we're doing. Here's a game plan. And uh, he told you flat out and honestly. So you always knew what you were getting with Berkey, and I've always appreciated that. And you know what? He he talked about actually, um, you know, taking a chance on you and wondering with all the stuff that you've gone through. I mean, we even got into that. And I know I I pretty much kind of knows the story right now. We're going to dip into it here in a little bit, but, Leading up to that, like he was like, "Are you, you know, you went through a lot of shit, You're fucking yeah. traumatized." And he's like, "Am I? Like, I'm gonna fucking is this kid gonna just feel sorry for himself?" That I mean, that's I yeah. think those are his exact words. And you fucking killed it, man. You went in and like, "No, no, 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 I'll fucking do what I gotta do." My parents are still yeah. around. They still love me the whole time. They love me. I'm okay. I'm gonna fucking rock and roll. And he said that was one of the best decisions uh, he's ever made as a uh, hockey guy. Man, it's pretty cool stuff. Yeah, very cool. It's, uh, you know, at the time, all that stuff was just enough in my rear view. I think that it, it didn't, it didn't bother me. It didn't manifest into anything until honestly the last three years. So it's, you know, it, it, for whatever reason, I think with all the changes in my life, becoming a father and, and how, you know, kind of looking at the end of my career in the next couple of years here as changes that are, are bringing up old stuff for me. So at the time, Berkey certainly, you know, took a chance and, and it paid off, but uh, all the things that I answered correctly for him, you know, waited 10 years to kind of manifest, unfortunately. So you got to go through it eventually. And now I'm kind of facing some of those, those demons that uh, have kind of lurked in the background for a very long time. I'm facing them now and, and doing well with it. Well, that's good, man. We love hearing that. And, and listen, I, I, I want you to tell your story, you know, and first off, I'm curious cause, because the first time I learned about really like the specifics that he's hearing it from you was around the 2010 Olympics when yep. a lot of these stories were being told and, and, you know, you were being asked about it. You were pretty forthright with, you know, telling specific details of your up- upbringing. Uh, how uncomfortable was that for you? Or were you just ready to get it off your chest and let the whole world know your story? I think it's always uncomfortable to a degree, but I, what I really wanted to do and the reason I think I've always been forthright about it is a, because there's, there might be one kid out there that resonates or has a similar story that mm. can say, okay, here's a, here's a path, right. Or here's just a way to get through it. But more than that, it, I thought it would be wrong to my mom and dad if I didn't tell the story in our words, right. And give, give people some clarity and, and I think answers, um, directly from the source, because if you don't answer them and you don't stand up there and, and be forthright about things, somebody's going to take the story and put their spin on it. And mm-hmm. I thought, you know, with the, with the very little bit of information out there, it could make my mom out to be worse off than it was, or to my dad to be the villain, um, which certainly I could understand people's thoughts on that, but um, not to the level that it was right. Not, not, not to give the facts the way they were would have been a discredited both of them. So I've always tried to do that to protect my family. Yeah, man, you got to, you have to, you just look, you got fucked up. I mean, it is what it is. Yeah. Like he did, he fucked up. It's yeah. weird. Cause he were, he was with you all night too that night. Right? And look, I don't know. I don't know enough about it, but, but here's a gist of what he fucked up and horrible. <laughs> yeah. okay. Yeah. But, but, but after that, everything was about you. And helping yeah. you and getting together and protecting you and helping your career. And in the end, you're like, damn, like, I know your mom passed a, a couple of years ago. And I, I just I, we read your 
uh, your blog on uh, Players Tribune, which is fucking puts a tear in my eye, man. I get it because my mom and dad are fucking sitting right next door, and my dog is barking right now. And I gotta yell at them to tell the dog to stop barking. So I get, I get that, man. But as a whole, how I look at this whole story is they it was a fuck up, and you're, they came together, and you fucking helped you just realize you gotta be a man. And um, I don't know. I, I, again, I, I just I think it's a at the end it's a it's a, a a pretty good turnout. Yeah, I think so. I think the yeah the I, I I give a lot of credit to both of them for handling things after the fact, right? Um, and not not so much from them from a personal standpoint, but they gave me opportunities to succeed in very very tough circumstances. Right, my dad's in jail, but. Uh, still interested and still helping along with every decision, whether that would be, you know, in direct communication or through, um, you know, Bobby Clark is, is one of the catalysts that helped me when I was trying to figure out how to make the next step in New Jersey and, um, you know, let me use the gym and all, all those things. Like he, he found ways to get things done from inside. And my mom was just a consummate mother, right? She just, uh, you know, she gave me free reign, but always pulled back on him if she thought I was taking things too far, uh, in any direction and, and yeah just I mean it, she made a ton of sacrifices for a long period of time to let me do this and uh, you know like any kid just greatly appreciated of the two of them finding a way to make that work hey Cam if I gave you the option to buy a car you can either go to the dealership or you can buy it from your house from the crib Oh, my God, Andy Bellman, they make it so easy for you. They'll come to you, not to mention they'll have videos of, of any car that you want. They'll, they'll go right through it. They'll show you the ins and outs of everything, make it completely simple for you. And uh, I tell you what, they're great people to work with. They've been in the game a long time, Andy. They're huge hockey fans. They do a lot of charity work in this city, and they make it comfortable for you to go buy a car at Bellman. Exactly. And we're dealing with a pandemic. Cam didn't know that, but everybody else knows we're dealing with a real pandemic. This is serious stuff. And so that's why they're making an adjustment to make life as easy for you. Because people out there still need transportation. People out there were still planning on buying cars. Doesn't mean that you have to put that on hold. The NHL season's on pause, but your car aspirations don't need to be. www.bellman.com. You can email them. You can text them. They've got so many different ways. And again, they will do a virtual uh, meeting with you where they'll walk around cars. They'll show you the exterior. They'll show you the interior. Answer any questions you may have about the engine or the performance. And great lease deals. You can buy a new car. Pre-owned deals as well. And again, if you're a current Bellman customer, listen up to this as well. Because they will come to you with a nice, clean loaner car, all sanitized. You don't have to worry about the the big germs because they took care of it. They cleaned it all up for you. They'll leave you with the loaner car, take your car back to the shop, service it up for you, and then deliver it back to you. That's what I call service, Cam Jansen. They make it too easy, Andy. Everybody's going to start doing this kind of stuff now. They're innovative. Uh, they're great people. Check them out. Bellman. Bellman.com. If you can't get there, they'll come to you. Again, Bellman, Buick, Cadillac, GMC, or right across the street. Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram, Bellman Automotive Group, proud sponsor and big time supporter of what we're doing here on the Cam and Strick podcast. www.bellman.com. Okay, so Bobby, so for people who don't know, because you know, like you know, Cam has asked the question, people might be wondering, oh, yeah. what exactly happened? But I fucked the timeline. But, I'm sorry. So, so when you're when you're a young kid, like you're growing up in New Jersey, um, your dad. Uh, got accused of some abuse with your mom, right? And and explain what happened, which led to you guys ending up in Canada and then California, and what that was like for you and your family, because he was obviously charged and apparently jumped bail. You can tell me if I'm getting the story wrong here. And just kind of essentially being on the run as a young kid, like, were you aware that the authorities were looking for your dad? And, and, and what was that like, which even led to you changing your last name, man? Yeah, we knew. Um, we we knew the the plan was always to leave as soon as we knew my dad was going. They were looking for eighty five percent of his, his jail time. Um, so you know, we took off. He took off first, and I spent another year in New Jersey with my mom. Um, you know, trying to get a fair in orders, but not really getting a fair in orders. We, uh, you know, we lost the house. We uh, essentially we lost everything, but my dad was out looking for a place for us to land. And, um, he tried, I, he tried North of the border for a long time. I, like I heard, you know, 
I get phone calls from Canmore, Alberta, and Peterborough, uh, Ontario, and he said this isn't the place. And uh, his issue with all the Canadian places was that, that they took the ice out in the summer in all the small towns, so there was no ice available. Um, so he finally calls from California and said, I found it. I said, what do you mean, Orange County, or excuse me, L.A. County, uh, Manhattan Beach, California? And he said, there's two coaches here. Um, you have to come see it. So I came out. I remember getting on the flight to go out there, uh, kind of like hiding where we were going, because uh, my mom didn't come. She put me on a cross-country flight, and I landed in L.A., uh, went and tried out for this Junior Kings program that was just kind of getting its footing. My dad had begged them to hold a spot and said, I promised the kid will make the team. Uh, my tryout wasn't with other kids. It was like a men's pickup noon game where <laughs> the coaches came out and skated. Uh, and then after the, you know, right after the skate, they said, you made the team. Can you be back for the start of the season? So that was when I left there knowing we were going to have to come back very quickly. So went home, didn't say goodbye to anybody really, you know, just an immediate family that knew what we were doing and uh, got in a van and met my dad in D.C. at it. I still don't know how he traveled, but uh, we drove cross country and I was playing for the Junior Kings within a, like a month and a half. It was kind of a whirlwind, but uh, we knew what was going on. I knew my name changed, my birthday changed. Um, you know, we had our backstory and kind of how I would recite things to people that brought it up. So uh, I was homeschooled for all intents and purposes. My homeschooling was basically just here to read a book. So it was, that's uh, fucking brutal by the way hey, like doesn't that suck yeah. to do that you can't even talk to anybody you're not like yeah. you can't socialize like fu- it fucks you up yeah and you know that was what, my seventh sixth grade seventh grade I, I don't even know at this point uh year so i was just starting to you know like make friends in new jersey that obviously we're going to be friends for a long time but um you know that kind of all got up and and um, you know, I was okay with that because it meant that I didn't have to go to school. I could live on the beach and play hockey every day. Uh, <laughs> but it, it did suck. I had like, I had zero and, and a lot of people still tell you that I still do have very, very s- small set of social skills that can get me by in situations. But, uh, uh, I spent a lot of time alone. So I became a bit introverted through it, but, uh, you know, I don't think I change it now. I, I really don't. I think it, uh, it all worked itself out in the correct way. So let me ask you this. So first off, the immediate family, like, were they aware of the situation? And like, when your dad leaves for a year, like you, you know what he's doing and, and like just crossing the border and everything, like how scared were you as a kid? Like how old were you at this point in time? And were you worried every single day that the police, that they were going to find him? Like, did, were you thinking about that all day long or it never really crossed your mind? Paint the picture oh, yeah. for it. Yeah, no, you, you certainly, it was every time you, you passed a cop, it was, it felt different, right? It just, uh, I, I think your anxiety is high and your alert level is high. Um, you learn to essentially kind of hide out in your own skin. Uh, and we were worried and, and we were worried for the right reasons because eventually they did find him. And it was only, I think, six months or so that we were back together in California before he was caught. Um, so you, you, yeah, you get used to it. Um, it's a shitty thing to get used to at 12 and 13, right? But mm-hmm. it is what it is. It was is what we had to do to stay together and all that kind of stuff. You just, uh, yeah, you just grin and bear it. But we were certainly on alert. Uh, I remember I made a friend out there that I was playing roller hockey with quite a bit, and uh, this kid actually, and he ended up going on to play some games in the NHL. I actually played with him in his first game. His name was Brian Salcido. His dad was the chief of police in the small city that we were in. And oh, God, I had no idea. I had been at their house and, you know, winging things. And finally, I found out his dad was the chief of police. And I came home and told my dad. And he's like, well, you're going to have to be on, you know, you're going to have to do a very good job of what you're doing. So uh, wow. you fast, fast forward two years. And he was my coach my last year with the Junior Kings. It's very Damn. Wow. And so, can I ask you something, man? And, and, and I guess you don't have to answer this, but I, I am curious. I, I watched that interview and, and they asked you, was your dad physical towards you? And no. Was he physical towards no. your mom? No. Did he lose it? But why do you think he fucked up that night? Was he drinking whiskey? Like, was he fucking, was there something, di- no, seriously, was he, was no. there something, di- what, did your mom, when he, she texted him, was it something that just like, something that just dug at him so bad he couldn't control himself? Yeah, I still don't know all the details on that. I, I have, I have 
basically the same amount of information that is out there in the story. Um, and, and I never dug any deeper on it, but, um, like just about any bad situation that, that does happen, alcohol was involved. And, uh, I know he was at a bar late and, uh, came home and something set him off. So I never, I never went too much deeper with that. No, no. You know what we, that night, um, and I, I woke up all the time when, when things were happening, but, uh, that night I didn't. That night we went and watched the St. Louis Blues because anybody knows me. I was like a the holy baby, Eckhart Hall, holy Super baby, 10, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> motherfucker. Yeah, we I all are motherfucker. Card. Dude, Fuck I was, yeah. I was, I was nuts about them. They took me to the game. We had like glass seats. I remember them smiling yeah. at me because I had the whole hat, I had the whole shirt, everything. Um, you know, and and I slept right through everything, but. That being said, now Holly is my real my realtor. <laughs> just helped me buy a place down in Nashville. So, <laughs> oh my god, go on down, yeah. motherfucker! And you can play yep. our our every year we go down. It's called Guitar Picks and Hockey Sticks. We go down there and we have we set teams up. There's a big tournament down there. We have fucking a blast, man. We got yep. Holly. Well, so it's so funny that you say it. Sorry, and I know this is your question next, but I guess it's is revol- you know involves both of us. I mean, Brett Hall got all of us into fucking hockey. Like in the eighties, yeah. no one. I mean, yeah, blues are, but then Holly came in, and that's how we all started. I made it, and everybody gets in, and all these guys. But we all watched Brett Hall growing up because he was just, just a fucking man, is what he was. Yeah, he's simple with that yeah. mullet too. Yeah, yeah no, he was this flow. Yeah, he's not much flow on that on his, his head now anymore, eh? He's got a short. He's, he's, yeah. he's got a mohawk. He's got a mohawk. He's a tough yeah. guy now. He's like a fucking raider or something. I don't know. <laughs> hey, so the so listen the when the, when they finally found your dad though, and the, you've talked about this when they burst down the door. I mean, just I mean, U.S. Marshals coming and banging down the door. Ooh, like, does that damn. memory stay with you? You think about that? Like, what was that moment like for you? How old were you then? I would have been. I think I was 12, maybe 13, uh, maybe coming up on 13, I want to say. So, yeah, I, I mean, we were in a really small apartment, and uh, it was actually a loft, so they were on the second store, and I was on the first, so they had to go through me to get up there. And um, there was, you know, a lot of them. Um, I, I don't remember the number, but it was it was something that I, like, I don't know why I didn't think about it for a very long time. Uh for whatever reason, it just became a distant memory, but, uh, you know, it's circled on me a lot in the last couple of years and, uh, gotten a little harder. So it's, uh, you know, it was four o'clock in the morning. So you, I was fuzzy, but the guys, are, the, I will say this, like the guys are good to me. Like they, they, they weren't aggressive by any means. They realized I wasn't a threat by any means at all. So, um, they chatted with me, they gave my shit dad a chance to give me a hug and say goodbye and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, that's, well, as you could want that situation to go, it went. They were they were uh, almost friendly. It was kind of annoying, to be honest with you. Well, and listen, was, I, I, what, I, let me follow one up real quick. Okay, Cam. okay was, fine. Was, fine. It, was it almost a relief for the family just to get it going and get it behind you because you're hiding out and you just got to wonder. Every single day you're wondering, is this the day that's going to happen? Was, was there any relief at all just to kind of – Get the process going and eventually get it behind you. Uh, not on not on my behalf. I wasn't ready for it. Um, I, I would have liked my dad around a little longer at that point in my life. But uh, we we discussed it all the time that it was going to happen. We just we just didn't know when. And the the deal was that he was going to turn himself in eventually. Once I was probably once I went to the OHL, kind of at that level, right? Um, where where things are a little more controlled and I had people around me that could, you know, help shape me. And uh, uh, we weren't ready for that yet. I, I certainly wasn't. And uh, I it didn't, it didn't make the status quo change by any means, except for the fact that, because I still had to, we still had to stay Ryan, right, which I eventually kept as my last name anyway. But, uh, you know, at that point we had set up this new life and we were living in, so we had to continue with it. And that was, uh, that was tough. Well, here's here's what I was going to say too. Um, when that all went down, when the SWAT team came in, but didn't they didn't they fuck something up? Then they that because he had he had attempted murder charges, but then they they didn't put attempted murder, so they thought they put murder charges down. So that's why they went in so aggressively. So when you say that they were nice yes. to you, they first fucked up, and then yeah. they're like, oh fuck, okay, never mind. Maybe I, I, how'd that all go down? 
uh, what I what I do know is that they they thought they were coming in strong for uh, a man wanted for murder and terroristic threats. And yeah, that's so a good not dog. The case. Yeah, so Jesus, I think they got into the apartment and were like, "Okay, what, what are we doing here? Right? Like, why did why did we bring forty plus guys or whatever it was?" Um, so I think they. Well, who set that up then? Them. Why? Uh, I have no charges? idea. All right, all right, yeah, well, yeah, I, I actually don't. Yeah, no clue. Um, I, I just know the district attorney in New Jersey wanted my dad so badly that was stopping at nothing. And that's kind of what I always thought was that they trumped up some, some okay. heavier charges to, to elevate it. So when did you change your name and how did the family all come to the realization and the, the decision to make the change? And was it true that you watched the movie saving private Ryan? That's how you came up with the last name Ryan. Is that how you came up with it? Yeah. My, that's how my dad came up with it. Um, it, the real reason was because it was short and it was Irish and it was easy to forge uh, on any certificate. So that's what I, that's what I was told. And uh, I didn't get any choice in the name, which I mean, Ryan seemed easy enough to me. Um, we changed my birthday from, you know, three seventeen, which is St. Patrick's Day to three nineteen because all you had to do was add that little, you know, that little line for a seven to look like a nine. Ooh, yeah. Kind of oh, thing. yeah. Um, so, and we lived, Everything seemed to fit. We lived in apartment 319. I remember that. So when people, I had all these cues behind me. 319 was my birthday. 319 was where I lived. All this kind of stuff that just tried to make it as easy as possible on me. And uh, yeah, it was it was yeah, it was it was weird. <laughs> but uh, uh, you you go from Stevenson, which is arguably a long, hard last name, to Ryan. Uh, I actually quite I I enjoyed that. It, it made everything so much easier for me. I uh, so. So you, you you say you're in you had to go through the program, right? Uh, Sorry. You okay. So you said that you were okay whenever you were young, and then now it's kind of hitting you a little bit. So you you were drinking quite a bit, and then you went into the program, the NHL program. Oh, which oh, I, sorry, I thought you meant the NTDBP. Yeah, yeah that's what I thought. Wait, 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 yeah. Would you wait? wait, wait what the fuck you talking about? When Cam asked questions, motherfucker, that was a decent you. question. Okay. That was a de- <laughs> fuck. I have experiences on this shit, so I fucking know, Andy. Sorry. <laughs> You went through, so are you okay now? Like you booze and like did all of a sudden so you're okay for a while, you sign a monster contract, you have some fucking money where you're like, fuck, I'm I'm just I'm gonna drink my problems away. Were you still thinking about that? Your mom and dad are okay, like they were okay, they love you. So what how yeah. what, what's going on with that whole thing? So it's hard to I guess put in the words how it escalated, but it didn't it didn't escalate until the last three years and um I lost my mom three years ago and I think that had something to do with a lot of stuff that, you know, kind of came back up for me. Um, you know, a lot of conversations that probably needed to be had that, that all of a sudden can't be, um, that that's part of it. But I, I think I, part of me always had this, uh, mindset that was, you know, okay, go to juniors, work, get drafted, work, get into the league, work, sign contract, sign contract, whatever, et cetera, et cetera. Like all these metaphorical checklists and things that I wanted and knew that I had to do. And I got to a point where I had hit everything. Obviously I haven't won a cup that's on there and things like that. Right. But, um, from a financial standpoint, it was, you know, a lot of people that know me know that money's not a big part of my life, but it, it, means everything to me because I never I'm going to have the lights turned off like we did. I'm never going to have to run from creditors. So I got, I got comfortable, right? I just got, I just got to a point where everything that I had wanted, I had achieved from a personal side of things, you know, the kids were born. Um, and then I had this moment of panic where you're just wondering what's next. Like, what do you have to do? And I felt like I finally could let my guard down and I let my guard down. And a lot of those problems kind of, manifested but came forward whatever you want to call it um and i dealt with them the wrong way right and, uh it's not i wasn't the kind of guy that was out drinking every night or anything like that it was just when i did first i drank to be more philosophical so i could answer some of the questions i wanted and then realized okay the answers aren't coming maybe i'll try another one and uh it got to a point where i just couldn't control it anymore and it was taking its toll on my wife right who's who's nothing short of awesome, uh, you know, finally said like, this is, you, you're not making good decisions. You're, you're 
you know, you're getting short, you're really, really doing a lot of isolating and spending a lot of time by yourself and uh, you need to kind of look in the mirror. So uh, I was trying to do it for a while on my own and it just wasn't sticking. I'd be I'd do great and then I would fly off the handle and uh, finally I just got off the ice in Detroit and said I'm getting on a plane. So tell me where the plane's going pretty, pretty much and went out to California and entered the program. Well, wow. so um, what was rock bottom like for you? And I know you mentioned your wife, and I think it's awesome that she's there to support you and you've got some support system because, you, you know, you're going to need that, not just today and tomorrow, yeah. but for the rest of your life, Bobby, you're going to have to have that. And it's great that she's going to be there for you. But when you hit rock bottom, is there a former teammate, a current teammate that you confided in that you told, hey, listen, man, this is what I'm doing. This is what I need. Like, who did you talk to besides your wife? Well, I had talked to some guys and um, previously, like I, Sheldon Surrey, who is obviously very vocal about his sobriety and, and um, lives here at Gosser. I sat with him a few times last summer and just kind of talked about it and tried some meetings with him. And, um, you know, I, I'm still not a meeting guy. I still don't enjoy those. I go when I feel like I really need one. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, he kind of just talked about his experience. Nate Thompson's the guy that I've texted back and forth with quite a bit that uh, I have a lot of respect for. He's, you know, he's over three years sober and I played with him in the worlds and I played with him in, in Ottawa. Um, I was actually always, I was really jealous of him because he just handled it so, so well, right. Even being out with the guys and not drinking and just, uh, you know, he was a guy that I kind of, I'm still learning the lifestyle part of it from. Um, mm-hmm. and how to be comfortable in situations. But yeah. I, I, I didn't call those guys indirectly. I called my wife that day and, uh, you know, just said, hey, I'm making this decision. I'm sorry, but you're going to be on your own here for about a month uh, with the kids. And she, she was good about it. Uh, and then after, it, I mean, the news broke, it was going to break. Uh, a couple of days later, a lot of guys reached out. And uh, that kind of started dialogues with a bunch of different guys at that point. So still, there's there's a, pretty good sized community of players out there that are either in it or have been through it, uh, or are thinking about it that, uh, you know, you're able to, you're able to bounce ideas off of just talk to and check in with. I, I really like it. No, man, I, I, I completely get it. I, um, Brian McGrath another one, by the way, you need to call him. Yeah. You have talked to him too. Oh yeah. He yep. went through, Oh, in Ottawa, man, like going through it. I went through a lot of stuff too, man. Like again, you know, you just get you get stuff thrown in your face, and and I, I was in a different spot than what, what you did, but um, but but I understand it, man. Like it's just like you, and you have to be able to s- still socialize, and that's the most difficult because you're out with all the guys, but you don't want to be that guy that's like, "I'm not going out because I need to be," and then guys kind of like, you know, push you aside. So it's just like a balance, man. So it's it's yeah. tough, dude. I I tip the cap to you, man, big time. Yeah, no doubt about it's, that. Uh, it's, uh, it's that's that's a work in progress. Obviously, there were nights out throughout the year when I like even when I came back and the guys were going to go out and as they should, right? They're that's yeah. that's uh, you you get three or four nights a year as a team, they should go out, but nobody and again, our team's so young, nobody's going to tell a guy that's been around for 13 years you have to come out tonight. So I said, yeah. <laughs> when I when I wanted to relax and, and let them go out, like they they should go out, that's their right, and, and I'll be there, and I'll make sure everybody's up and ready for practice the next morning yep. if we have it. But, uh, yep. Yep. I, I'll find that balance, and I'll find my way back to that mix when I'm when I'm comfortable socially, not drinking. It's just, uh, I'm not there yet, but a little bit better every day. You will be, man. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was asking. Like, yep. how, do you, how do you handle the day-to-day? Like, does your wife, does she pop open bottles? Like, she, does she drink wine, or is she just completely going sober with you to respect your situation and and like how tough are the days like are some days easier than others and, and, how, and how you hanging up you know holding up now um no every day is good actually right now I, I i everything even even though sobriety doesn't get put on hold everything else has because of the, of the situation the world's in right now so mm-hmm. it feels like everything's in a holding pattern my my wife doesn't never has been much of a drinker but um uh, you know, if we go out to dinner and she wants a glass, I, I actually kind of push her to because I'm like, I don't yeah. want you to feel awkward. Get her drunk. Uh, Get her drunk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let the fun begin. But, yeah. it, it's to the point where, like, I, I got back on the on the bus with the guys on my first road trip. And, you know, there's there's beers and you could sense some hesitation. And I, I don't want that. So, um, you know, I yeah, just moved to a different spot on the bus so that they didn't feel like I was in their way. And 
honestly, it took one road trip for the guys to be like, oh, okay, this doesn't bother you. Like you can have beers at the card table. Yes. I'm not, uh, I'm not yeah. the kind of guy that's going to be licking the bottom of the beer. Like we're fine here. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. I've been there. It's not a good scene by any means. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, uh, you know, we're just finding the balance and, uh, you know, right now I'm doing great. It's, I, I, they call it the pink cloud. I think when you're first sober and it just seems easy and that's where I'm at now. Um, I know those days will get harder, you know, especially midsummer when everybody's going out on the weekends and things like that. But, uh, the golf course up here, all that kind of stuff, but I'm not, you know, I'm not shying away from any of those challenges. If you want to tackle it, you kind of got to tackle it head on. So, uh, that's, you know, what the other good part about it is there's such a sober curious movement, which is something I've been reading about that like, you know, some people just abstain to abstain, not because they have an issue that, that people are sensitive towards that. So if I, if people ask me and I say, no, there isn't that kind of peer pressure anymore. Uh, and I've noticed that like, it, I just say no, and I don't say I'm sober or anything like that. I just say, no, I'm good. And nobody really, nobody's really forced my hand at any of that. So, uh, it's been good for me. No, you, you, but you have to get, you to be able to do that, man. Cause you know, you yep. can't, they don't have to cater to you. They don't have to do that. So you just got to be able to, and you still need to be a part of the team. And that's the most difficult spot one way or the other. Are you doing, yeah. do you take CBD oil? Is there any alternative for you? Are you just stone cold sober and just going, I don't care, cold Turkey on everything. Like, um, I mean, do you have any fix whatsoever? Um, Unfortunately, I still chew. So <laughs> my uh, so you my smoke chewing. once every day? No, I'm, you still <laughs> chew. Oh my god! No. Well, that's the other part of the program is right when you're in the stage that I'm in, you're you're, you're getting tested and things. So everything yeah. would go anyway. Um, yep. But that. you know, that's not a. I I never really pursued that other route anyway. It just hasn't been my thing. So um, I'm just stone cold sober and and actually enjoying it. And you know. Um, it, it's worked uh, until it doesn't work. Uh, I'll stay the path here. And then we'll, if something comes up, we'll, I guess, try an alternative method. But yeah, for right now I'm doing great. And uh, every day waking up and kind of setting my day, right. Getting my mind right. And, and, you know, right now being dead. You know, your so, chewing goes, your chewing goes down when you stop drinking. Sorry, Andy, I had to throw that in there. Your chewing goes down when you stop drinking too, by the way. So you're probably <laughs> weaning off that shit as well. <laughs> So mine's gone up. Mine's gone up a ton. I gotta work on that. I, yeah, I, I would think. I would way. think it goes up. I would think it goes. Oh, up. when you're drunk, you want to chew. When you're doing, yeah, I don't know. But everybody's different, yeah, Andy. Good. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, what's your relationship like with your dad now? Like, how, what, you guys talk every day. You guys have a great relationship. Is he a good grandfather? And and when he was in jail, people may not know he went to jail for five years. Did did he? Did you keep him abreast of how your hockey career was going? And did he know when he got out, like. Were you guys yeah. talking? Like he knew, like you were a big time prospect, right? Yeah, he did. He uh, we kept in touch all through through letters and stuff like that, and the occasional phone call. The problem was we had no money, so he, every time he called from prisons to collect, we would, <laughs> the, the phone call would be like, "You have a call from inmate," and he'd say his name, and we'd be like, "Ah, oh, shit!" <laughs> like, we'll, we'll accept the charges, but uh, there was a moment of hesitation where, like, should we hang up and, and fax him something instead? Uh, <laughs> but he was aware. He knew what was going on. Um, he had gotten out right before my NHL draft, um, and was living at the gym in New Jersey and, and, you know, getting his feet back together. But he, uh, he actually skipped, uh, parole to come to the draft, uh, which he wasn't really, wasn't really given permission for and then went on house arrest after the draft, but there was no way he was missing it. So he found his way to Ottawa for that. And, uh, <laughs> no, we're good now. We talk a lot. Um, uh, you know, he's, he's, my daughter's finally getting to the age where she can really talk to him on the phone. So he's enjoying that. Um, you know, and he's, he's doing well in Jersey. He, he seems to like everything he's doing there. Uh, and, and we, I don't get back nearly enough. He hasn't met my little guy yet. And that's mostly my fault, but, uh, yeah, maybe this summer when all this clears, we'll get back and spend some time together. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Good, man. That's awesome. That's good, man. And, and I'm so happy that you, you know, gone on to have your career, man. And, and listen, when you came back, and you had your first home game. You scored oh. a hat trick. Oh. It's one of the yeah. greatest moments that I can remember seeing uh, watching the National Hockey League. So congratulations on that, man. That's one Thank of the best you. moments of the year. And what, what, what was it like for you? I mean, that had to be just – I mean, after the game, did you break down on your own thinking about it? Or were you just on cloud nine? What were you thinking about? Uh, you know what? To be honest, after the game, I got home uh, and – 
my my wife stayed up. She went to the game, so caught it. Obviously, she hasn't seen many games with the kids now, but uh, she went to that one, and uh, I, I was wrung out and exhausted. Um, it was just, I think, emotionally spent. The, the next game, I think we played Detroit, and I was terrible. Um, <laughs> Usually, the case. I, I just, yeah, I just, I couldn't. I slept great, and and uh, and all that, and and felt like my body recovered, but emotionally, I think I was just. You know, I was charged for a couple of days, so coming down from that was a lot. Um, but I started to get my footing again and playing well towards the end. And I'm, you know, I was really looking forward to feeling good about the way I ended the season, and then this happened. So it's, you know, it's unfortunate but necessary, and I get it. But uh, yeah, that game was it was by far the most emotionally wrung out I had been after a, a hockey game, just trying to come down from it. And, not only answer the text messages and get back to your friends, but, uh, you know, to, to realize, okay, in 12 hours, I got to be back on the ice for practice. So this will be forgotten pretty quickly. Uh, it's, it's never uh, going to be forgotten, Bobby. It's never going to be forgotten. Let me, let me just not, say that. Let me just say this, dude, honestly. And, and, you know, the Maroons love you, man. And you've gone through a lot of stuff, dude. Dude, you got, you got family, you, 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 you're, you're set up. You're doing good. You just gotta you gotta kick this alcohol thing, man. I know we're all gonna eventually. I'm gonna have to go through this shit too. Don't get me wrong. Like, it's just gonna happen, especially in quarantine. Like I'm not gonna fucking lie to you right now. Case, but my wife's looking at me. Like it's just you have a ton of people you can call with support. Yeah, a ton of yep. fucking people, dude. You're in a good yes, spot, man. You're in a good spot. You got an all, like, interesting, crazy story, man. But you got through it. And I don't know, man. It's just I'm, I'm, glad, we got, listen, I'm glad we got to fucking talk to you, dude. I know. I reached <laughs> out to, to Chris Weidman this morning, Brady Kachuk, man. These guys all have so much respect for you, man. They love you, dude. Everybody yeah. loves you, man. Yeah, they're, so, so, uh, they're good kids. Thanks for doing this, dude. I appreciate it. And all the best to you and uh, your family, man. This has been an enjoyable conversation. Thanks for being honest with us, dude. I know it's not always easy talking about this stuff, but we wish you no nothing worries. but the best, bro. Yeah. One more no thing. Worries. One, one more thing, Bobby. Motherfucker, I want an invite up to the cool club in Idaho. We're coming I didn't to make Gaza, that much, I didn't make that much fucking Gaza. money. I didn't make that much fucking money. I want the invite. I'll entertain all you cats. Bring us up you know there. Maybe I'll bring Andy along. You guys come up. I'll, uh, I, I still got a wine cellar, so I can still pour for you guys. But uh, I'll, nice. I'll drink all your booze. I'll drink all your booze. <laughs> <laughs> you you he, he's made about $75 million, you know. He's got a nice pay. Oh. A room or two, you know? oh, yeah. <laughs> We're staying with you. Phil's had the open invite for years. I haven't seen Phil yet. Oh well, well he's he'll be he's listening to this thing in about twenty minutes. Bobby, <laughs> you're the fucking man, dude. You're fun. You're fun as fuck to watch. You're a good kid. You've been through a lot, dude. Yeah. I appreciate you coming on, man. Appreciate you coming. My on, pleasure, dude. guys. Thanks, Thanks for the man. You. See you, Bobby. See you, buddy. See you guys. Well, that was Bobby Ryan Cam, brought to you by www.bellman.com. Check out bellman.com for a new set of wheels. And, of course, coke24.com, www.coke24.com. Man, that was a loaded interview. Loaded interview. Yeah. And you know what? I just became a bigger fan of Bobby Ryan. I don't know what I did. I know. He's just a sweet kid. And, and, you know, a lot of people I know uh, are pretty close with him. And they just, nothing but, nothing but great things about him. And, again... Like it was a situation where he had no, he had no control over, it. and it was just it was put towards him, and whatever happened happened. But he he got out of it, and I know he's still going through a little bit of a tough time right now. Uh, he's still going to be strong. He's got a lot of support by a lot of guys, but um, but in the end, it's still a happy story. Like God Almighty, like he's in a good spot. He, they're financially okay, which is not everything, but it still helps. You know, he's getting himself help with, with as far as uh, rehab is concerned. And um, and his family, in the end, his family loves him. And they supported him since day one. And if you want to take a positive out of that whole story, uh, that's definitely one of them. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. And um, again, man, I mean, uh, he's got a lot of support around him. I, I give Brian Burke a lot of credit for taking a chance on this kid, too. Yeah, exactly. Him yeah. Second overall. And... You know, it shows Bobby Ryan has a lot of willpower as a person to be able to continue to to have success and to drive to becoming an NHL player, even with this situation with his dad being taken away for a handful of years there. Uh, so, Cam, listen, when, when you're a player and you're dealing with these type of situations, like Bobby Ryan was dealing with earlier this year with Ottawa, and then he steps away from the team, he goes to rehab. Like, yeah. have you ever seen a situation like that with a teammate? Like, how many options 
are there for players and do, it, do you feel like the, the environment is comfortable for players to come forward and, and say, hey, listen, um, man, I need help? Yeah, I do. I do, absolutely. And and, and, and Dr. Dr. Shaw is unbelievable. And I had a weird experience with a couple of things. And I played with guys that have been on the program. And it's just tough because you're just in the scene. And especially when you're young, if you're younger, Bobby's not. And he's, you know, he's got a family. So it's easier because your wife's take care of you. But I remember going through this. I remember being single and just young. And if I needed to go through that, it would just be very, very difficult because you just, the support, like, don't get me wrong, my parents supported me and I had every support possible. But just when you don't have a family and you haven't got it out of your system yet, it's very, very difficult. So I think that it's very easy to, to, they'll take care of you. And it's very private too, if you don't. Um, but, but, there, but yeah, man, it's, it's still not easy. Again, you're going to, events and, and, and out party, you know, at different parties here and there and Christmas parties and stuff like that. So it is tough. Um, and you know what? The guys, the guys can't, and the guys can't be around you and look at you and be like, Oh, we can't drink in front of, but no, no, they can't be like, they can't, that's not on them. You know, Bobby's got to do that on his own and he still has to be able to participate in different events with the guys too, even though they are going to be drinking. So those guys that are drinking can't look at Bobby and be like, Oh, we can't do it because he's got, that can't be the case, man. That can't be the case, and Bobby understood that, but that also makes it very difficult, too, because, um, again, you know, it's just thrown in your face at all times. Yeah, but I don't think – I think he, he even said it. He doesn't want guys to feel like Oh, but and some plus, people – He's not, he's he's not 25 years old either, man. Exactly. This guy's a, this guy's a veteran player who exactly. has the respect from his teammates, and he, he, he he's comfortable in his own skin where he can kind of totally. – like, Although it's not – It's, not, way it, gonna go, it's not easy. It, although it's not easy. No, for sure. You know, for sure. So, but he was cool, man. I just uh, wish like him nothing lot, but man. the best, man. I give him a lot of credit for coming forward, and uh, and we're pulling for for Bobby Ryan for sure moving forward. So that was a good, you know, glad we got him on. So uh, great job, Cam. And again, for people out there, you want to subscribe? Be sure to do so. How do they do that, Cam? Do you even know? Uh, yeah, you go to the Canvas Trick Pod at Canvas Trick Pod on every <laughs> platform, or follow me on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter, Cam Jansen twenty five. <laughs> What's your strict daddy something? Uh, at Andy Strickland. Yeah, on Twitter. Yeah, let's go. I'm flying at, around here. At, at Real Strict Nasty here on yeah. uh, on Instagram. I just opened it back up, by the way. I'm trying to build up my Instagram following. You, you need group. to. I you have not to. been active on that ever. And I'm, now getting, I'm, I'm getting my groove like, on. I'm trying to figure out this whole Instagram thing, man. I just I kind of like that even more than Twitter right now. I feel like it's yeah. more private, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, so, but Cam didn't know. You just go to YouTube, iTunes, Spotify. And uh, you'll find the Cam and Strick po- podcast. So we appreciate all the support. Again, sponsors out there who want to get involved, we'd love to hear from you as well. So hit us up, drop us a private message, and somebody will get back to you. Cam Jansen, great job, buddy. Thanks, dude. Talk soon.